Well, good morning and welcome to South Point Church. Is anyone at the Leonardtown campus fired up to be here this morning? All right, if you're fired up to be here, why don't you give a little fist bump to our Lusby crew. Hey, Lusby, we're glad you're with us. A little fist bump, everyone's giving it to you. And to those of you watching on video, we're so glad that you chose to be with us today. Hey, uh, if I could have everyone's attention, um, uh, before we dive into the message, I need to address something really, really important. Now, I wanna make this really, really clear just so everyone understands. The statement I'm about to make is not a statement about the left, it's not about the right, it's not about the middle, it's about Jesus. You know what, Jesus says, uh, the greatest to command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and all your strength. And he says the second is like it, to love your neighbor like you love yourself. And so here at South Point, our number two, two core value, number two, is everyone is loved and respected because we believe all people are made in the image of God. And right now, about an hour and a half away from us in our nation's capital, um, there is a march of hate. Um, and I think when people hate other people because of the color of their skin, the language they speak, speak, or any reason uh, that the church of Jesus, people that represent Jesus should stand up and protect people, tell people they're loved, um, let everyone know that everyone has dignity and respect, and Jesus died on the cross for all people. Can I just get an a amen? Um, and so I just want to acknowledge this morning uh, that as a church, um, we stand against hate. We stand against racism. We believe God loves all people. All people are welcome here at South Point, and we are all equal at the foot of the cross. And we with that being said, we also want to pray for our enemies. Jesus tells us that there'll be those who we don't agree with, but our response is not to hate them back. Our response is to love them. And so I wanted to take a second this morning to make sure that as a church, we didn't stick our head in the sand, that we didn't ignore what was going on in the world, that as we leave here today, that we would be Jesus, his hands and feet out in the world that is busted and broken and needs to see a God who loves people. So I'm going to take a quick second if you would pray with me, however that looks for you. Heavenly Father, God, we just pray, God, we pray that your church, people, and the church isn't a building organization, it's people. It's the people that call you by name, that when they see racism and injustice, that we would stand up and say, people have dignity. All people matter deeply to the heart of God. We don't have to agree with them, but we do need to love them and give them dignity and respect and care for them, God. So we stand against injustice. But God, we refuse to return hate for hate. God, we pray for those who have a broken and warped view, God, uh, that you would move the scales from their eyes and their minds, that they might see the truth, that not only are they loved, but that all people are loved. This is our hope and our prayer, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you as we needed to address that this morning. Hey, we're in week two of our series called Yes to Jesus and No to Religion. And as we kicked the series off last Sunday, we discovered a really couple of important truths. Um, and we kind of talked about this idea. Listen, everyone loves the idea of a relationship with Jesus. People are like, yes, I would love to have a relationship with Jesus. But too many of us actually settle for religion. And here's what we discovered. We discovered there's two reasons why I might, why you might, why me might actually settle for religion. We're going to put them up on the screen. The two reasons that we settle for religion is one is just the lack of know-how. Remember I said my best friend's question was something like this. He said, hey, listen, how do I relate to a God who I can't see and I don't hear? And I said, that was a great question. So sometimes we settle for religion because we go, listen, I just don't know how to relate to a God that like I can't hug, I can't text, I don't see on Facebook, like how to relate to a God I see. And then last week we covered the second reason why we might settle for religion and it was the hard part. So listen, here's the good news. We've already got the hard part of the message over with last week. We tackled the tough part, which is, listen, we love the idea, but hate the cost. We love the idea of a relationship with Jesus, but we really don't want any of the commitment or cost that comes with that relationship with Jesus. And so we might settle for religion because we, we really don't want to do that. And then here's, here's what we had to admit. Listen, you've experienced this. I've experienced it. Listen, we've all experienced it. And we're going to put it up on the screen. Listen, all relationships have rules. That's why you get mad at people. You get mad at people, I get mad at people, we get mad at people, we get offended because we know that all relationships have rules. Even a relationship with God has rules. It has boundaries, it should have honor, it should have surrender. All the things that we talked about last week, we discovered that all relationships have rules. And why do all relationships have rules? Because we know this to be true, you've experienced it, I've experienced it, we're gonna put it up here on the screen, it's this. Listen, one-way relationships, 
Right? Smile. Go ahead and say, it's okay. It's safe. We're done. This is just a recap. We're not going to stay here today. Smile. It's okay. One-way relationships are unhealthy and dysfunctional. Listen, none of us wants to be on the receiving end of a one-way relationship because we know it is unhealthy and it is dysfunctional. And that is true of a relationship with God where we do nothing and he does everything. That is an unhealthy, dysfunctional relationship because all relationships have rules. And if you missed it last week, you can go onto our website or onto our YouTube channel and you can catch up there. Today, we want to talk about the know-how. How do I relate to a God who I can't like physically hold, physically kind of see, um, physically can't audibly hear, at least I haven't audibly heard him. I believe he does speak, but that is the exception, not the rule. I think God does show up, but I, I think that's the exception and not the rule. So how do we relate to, to a God like that? And then we're left asking the question that my friend asked me that I said was one of the best questions ever asked. And we're going to put it up here on the screen. It says this, it says, how do I relate with God who I usually don't see physically? physically or hear audibly. I mean, that, that's the question, right? Like, listen, listen, I'm here today. Like I'm watching on the video. I'm in Lusby. I'm here because I want to know how to relate to a God, but how do I relate to a God that I, that I can't see and that I can't physically touch? And I think that is a great question. But before, in order to answer this question, we need to do things. To answer this question, you and I will need to do two things. And here's the two things we need to do. And we're going to put it up here on the screen. The first thing we need to do is admit a principle. And listen, here's what a principle is. A principle is something that applies beyond just itself. Like, so there might be a principle in a relationship that applies to all relationships that would actually apply to God. So one thing we have to do today is we have to admit a principle, and then we have to identify the practical. What does that principle look like in everyday life? So can we identify a principle that works in all relationships? And then what does that principle actually look like in, in, in practical everyday living? What, is, what does that look like for you and I as we leave church on Sunday. Now to be able to do these two things, we first need to ask maybe a better question because listen, here's a fair question. How do I relate to a God I can't see in here? That is a fair question. But what if there was a better question, a question that led to an easier starting point for relationship? Maybe asking what makes relationships work would be the place to start because it's easier and we can understand. We already know how to do that. Maybe asking what makes a relationship work might be the easiest and the best question to start with so we can figure out how to relate to God. Now, whenever you ask the question, what makes a relationship work? We need to admit something first. Okay, smile, it's okay, wave. I know it's hot out there, right? Listen, you can smile. Here's the first thing that we need to admit when we wanna go, what makes a relationship work? And it's this. Listen, just because you want a relationship to work doesn't mean that it'll work. Smile, right? Raise your hand if you've ever wanted a relationship to work. You wanted a friendship. You wanted to get along with a coworker. You wanted to date someone. You wanted to be like whatever. Like it's only two of you. Like the, all of you have never had. Like all of us have probably wanted a relationship. We wanted it to work, but it but it didn't. I mean, the relationship didn't work. And here's what we discover. Just because you want a relationship to work doesn't mean the relationship will work. Want to doesn't always equal it actually happening. And listen, I discovered this. I discovered this in my own relationships that just because I want to have them doesn't mean that they work. Um, and you know what? Sometimes this is, is part of the painful part of life is that when you want a relationship to work and then it doesn't, it just breaks your heart. And, and for me, I, I want to tell a true story of, of where I wanted a relationship to work, uh, but it didn't work. And, and to kind of set the context for the story of, of this relationship, I, I need to let you know, like, um, I grew up a little bit abnormally. Like, my, my mom, my biological mom and biological dad, they moved a lot. So I didn't live in any one place for more than like 18 months until I was 17 years old. Um, and so I didn't really get to make friends. I was kind of always moving. Um, I had some challenges, so I wasn't good at making friends. I had some emotional um, trauma in my life and so I wasn't good at relating to people um, and then I got locked up and then when I got out I was 17 and I lived in a foster home and like I wasn't really good at like having relationships I had acquaintances and I had some people that I would label as friends but it wasn't until I was into my mid-20s even early 30s that I knew how to have friends of my own age and my 
own demographic, like kind of just how do I relate to people in a friendship way? Um, and matter of fact, as, as I began to do that journey, I, I had a friend here locally in this county. Um, his wife was friends with my wife. I was friends with him. And, and it, was a, it was a good friendship. I and mean, we, we watched football on Sundays. We'd go over to his house in the summertime and, and we would cook out and grill out and it was great. And, and we would meet for breakfast on a regular basis just to hang out and connect. I mean, it, it was a really solid relationship. And here's the sad thing about that solid relationship is is that that we haven't spoken or seen each other in probably like the last five to seven years. And and you ask, well, did you get in an argument? And I would go, no. Um, Was there something that you disagreed about? And I go, no. And then they go, well, what happened to your relationship? Well, here's what happened to our relationship. Um, He got busy in his career and his family. I I was busy in in a season of my life where I had some health issues. I had a lot of life going on. And so I got really busy. And so we we just kind of stopped meeting. We stopped kind of talking and we said, oh yeah, we'll get together soon. Oh yeah, I'm busy, and, but we'll make time. And, and we said we'd make time, but then we never actually made time. And then slowly but surely, our relationship grew apart to where we don't even talk or text. And it's not because we did anything wrong. It's just because we didn't make time to hang out. And here's what I discovered. And you probably have already experienced and know this that relationships, if you do nothing, will grow apart all by themselves. You don't have to get in a fight. You don't have to argue. You don't have to do something wrong. If you just do nothing, relationships will always grow apart. Which leads us to a truth, and you've experienced this truth. You didn't need to come to church today. You've discovered this all on your own. We're going to put it up, and if you're following along in your interest, it's like this. Without genuine connection on a regular basis, what's that word? All relationships start to grow apart. Listen, without genuine connection on a regular basis, all relationships begin to grow apart. And this is where you and I discovered the answer to the question of what makes relationships work. It's genuine connection on a regular basis. You want to know what makes a a relationship work is connecting genuinely on a regular basis will help a relationship stay connected, stay strong, be growing, be healthy. But if you don't genuinely connect on a regular basis, all relationships, your marriage, your family, your friends, your, your co-workers, and with God. That listen, without genuine connection on a regular basis, all relationships start to grow apart. And now here's what's, here, here's what's mind-blowing. I mean, here's, here's where I just, it's so cool. This is why, this is why I love God. It's why I love Jesus. It's just why I'm a follower is before we discover this, Jesus told us this. Jesus told us this would happen. Matter of fact, as Jesus is speaking to people, he says, listen, this won't only just happen with people. This happens with God. Matter of fact, in the eyewitness account of the gospel, John, we're going to put it up on the screen. Here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. Now, Jesus was speaking to at a time and a culture where there wasn't Facebook, there wasn't Instagram, there wasn't, you know, a wall wall down the street and a, and a Harris Teeter or a food line, whatever you go to or Mickey D's. Now, people were hunters and gatherers. The only way that you ate is if you grow it or you killed it. So Jesus was speaking to an audience that understood, listen, if you want fruit, if you want substance, you got to find something that is growing and producing something. So he says, listen, I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. Yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. He's saying, listen, I'm the trunk, you're the branches. The only way you're going to get the substance to produce the kind of life that you are intended to produce, the kind of life you dream of is to be connected to the trunk where you'll get life. You need to be a branch that's connected to the vine. He says, those who remain in me and I in them will produce much um, fruit. For a part of me, you can do nothing. Now, I want to stop here and go something a little old school on y'all and preach here for just a second. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. It doesn't say be fruity. Right? See, I, I, listen, I, listen, I'm just going to go this way. Listen, I've seen Christians, you know, they, they just get over-religious. And Jesus says, don't be fruity. He says, produce fruit, which means, are you kind? Are you generous? Do you care for others? I'm talking about, does your life make a difference in the life of other people? Can people see the evidence of your life that Jesus is living in you and giving you life? Not are you some religious person who beats people with the Bible and, and you dress weird and act weird and, you know, everything's got to be, you know, you just add Jesus to everything. That's not what he's saying. He says, do you actually produce fruit? For apart from me, you can do. 
I don't know about you, have you ever bought a flower that's been cut? Have you ever, have you ever bought someone like a flower that's been cut? And, and here's what Jesus is saying is religiosity is like buying a rose that's been cut. You can stick it in the water and you can put that white powder in there and it looks alive, but it's already. And that's what religion is. We just put a little bit of water in our life, a little bit of stuff, and we try to look alive. But you know what? That, that, that rose or that, that whatever it is that's cut from the vine will never produce again because it has nothing to give it substance to produce what it needs to produce. And if we don't stay connected to Christ, that is us. Matter of fact, Jesus tells us, he continues to say, anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. You see, that's what happens to our relationships. When you and I don't genuinely connect, what happens to our relationship? It begins to wither. And here's what Jesus is saying. When you don't genuinely connect to God on a regular basis, your relationship with be begins to wither. You begin to get disconnected. You die. And then what, like you, it's, you can't produce what you were meant to do. Such branches are gathered into a pile and burned. And Jesus goes on to say, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask anything you want and it will be granted. And here's, here's what's so amazing this morning. Here's what's so cool. It's why, again, why I'm so grateful for the Holy Spirit, God, Jesus, and the Bible. Listen, Jesus tells us something that we need to know. Here's the principle. We're going to put it right up on the screen. Here's the principle. What makes a relationship great applies to both God and what makes a relationship great with people, which is we genuinely connect on a regular basis, and what is what makes a relationship with God work is that we have to genuinely connect with him on a regular basis. And you might be saying, well, Matt, you haven't answered the question, how do I genuinely connect with God who I can't see in here? And I'm going to get to that part in a second. But we have to admit right from the get-go that what makes a relationship work is genuine connection on a regular basis. Now you might be asking, Matt, Matt, what is genuine connection? Is it being in the same room? Listen, here's what I know. And, and people do this all the time. I, I love Jesus because I go to church. Listen, you can sit in an airport, but that ain't going to make you an airplane right? You can go stand in your garage. That ain't going to make you a car. You can go to a police station. That ain't going to make you a police officer. Like you and I know that just going somewhere doesn't make you something. And so what does genuine connection look like? And, 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 and here's what I want to share. I'm going to put up here. Here's what genuine connection really looks like. Sharing and sharing is more than talking because, you know, we've all had conversations with people that we go, like, I learned nothing. We did not connect. We talked about the weather. We talked about sports. We had a conversation, but there was no connecting. And husbands and wives, we've done this. Like if I'm watching sports and it's the fourth quarter and my wife tries to talk to me, I heard, but I sure didn't. Li like sharing is more than talking. Sharing means that you actually have to like let them see you. And, and the reality is, is that our best friends, our spouses, our family, those that we love, those that we have the best relationship, we actually share. They know who we are. They're the person that we take our mask off and we let them see us for who we truly are. All of our pain, all of our hurts, all of our faults, and yet they still like us. But at some point to genuinely connect, there has to be genuine sharing. You can't hide. You can't be fake. Second is listening, and it's more than hearing. Listen, we hear all the time, but hearing is very different than listening. Listening means you actually respond and you do something. You actually see someone for who they are, and you respond with your behavior. Listening is so much more than hearing, and then experiencing is more than being in the same place. It's shared experiences. These three things make for genuine connection, sharing, listening, and experience. Now, here's the most amazing thing. We can do this with God. We can share. We can listen. We can experience. He can share with us. We can listen to him. We can experience him. And you might be asking, well, how do we do all those things with the God that we can't see? Well, there's some things that we can do in practice. Remember, here's the principle that I put up here is, is that we have to admit a principle, which is, Genuine relationship, I mean, relationship takes genuine connection on a regular basis. Without that, it won't work. Well, we have to identify the practical. What are the practical things that you and I can do to share, to listen, and to experience God? Well, that's a great question. I'm so glad that you asked. Okay, so we're going to put on the screen. Here are some ways that you can see and hear God so that you can connect to Him. We can see and hear God through the, through the Bible. Now, some of you are like, I already knew this. And then I would go, great, have you read it lately? 
You know, they did a survey and they said like, listen, the average home in America has like three Bibles and some of you have 10. And every year you grab a new one year Bible. I want you to know the ending didn't change. <laughs> right? It's still the same. And, and here's the reality. I'm not telling you to read the Bible for some religious reason. Well, think about this. Think about this. When you want to start a relationship, say you want to start a friendship. Say you want to start a relationship when you're dating. Say there's someone in the office and you're thinking, man, maybe we can be best buds or maybe we can be BFFs. Maybe we can, like, what is the first thing that you do when you think you want to have a friendship with someone is you want to get to know them, right? You want to get to know them. So you know what we do? We Facebook stalk them. At least that's what I do. Before I get to know him, I'm looking at you on Facebook. Like, don't Facebook me as your friend as a pastor and then put, you know, stuff on there. I see it, by the way. Like, if you friend me on Facebook and then put crazy stuff, I go, oh, that's crazy. You, you know, I'm praying for you, <laughs> right? Like, the first thing we do is we want to see and hear some of these stories of these people. So, so we go on to Facebook. We look at their Instagram story. We begin to ask people that know them and say, what are they like? And we begin to hear stories. And if we go on dates or we hang out with someone we think we might want to be friends with, we'll go, hey, what did you do this weekend? And the reason you're asking that is you want them to share a... You want them to share a story because you want to get to know them a little bit better. And here's why you and I should regularly read the Bible. It's because it's God's story as he interacts with humanity. And if you want to be able to see and hear God, if you read the Bible on a regular basis, you'll get to hear and see who God really is as he interacts with humanity all throughout history. And as you look at his story, you can begin to see who he is. And here's what I've discovered. Not only do I get to see who he is, I begin to see who I am. And sometimes that's scary, and sometimes I don't like what I see. But it's very true. I was trying to think of a great example. Does anybody here got a grandma? Anybody here ever? All y'all got grandmas, just so you know. So you should raise your... Okay, gosh. Man, nobody's into it today. Raise your, hey, loves me. Raise your hand if you got a grandma. Raise your, anybody got a grandma? All y'all got grandmas, just so you know. Anybody got grandma, grandpa? Listen, I don't know when you were little, when you were little and you knew grandma and grandpa, but then what you really knew about them is they gave the best presents, right? They always gave you sugar right before they sent you home. They laughed. Grandma, grandpa always gave you the loud toy to play with to upset mom and dad, right? Grandparents are the best, right? And you went to the grandma and you loved them and they smelt funny, but, but you didn't know... It was my grandparents the only people that smell funny, right? Anyway, so, so you would spend time with grandma and grandpa, right? And you didn't really know much about them. You just knew that you loved them. But then every once in a while, grandma or grandpa would do something so that you got to know them a little better. They, they, they pulled out this antiquated thing called a, a photo album. Anybody remember what those things are? I mean, it's amazing. They used to print pictures, not just on your cell phones. They actually used to print them. And they'd put them in a little book. And some people uh, spent millions of dollars on those little cutout things. And, and they, you know, they make these books. And grandma and grandpa would sit out. And they would begin to tell you of the picture so that you could get to? See, that's what the Bible is. The Bible is the place where you and I go to get to see who God really is. And here's what I discovered. That as I read the Bible for myself, instead of looking at what other people said, I began to discover a God who was very different than what I had often heard about. Matter of fact, I love what the scripture says. Jesus is speaking to one of his disciples. I'm going to put up here. And it was a guy named Philip. And Philip said, hey, Jesus, Lord, just show us the heavenly father and we'll be satisfied. I said, listen, Jesus, I've been hanging out with you three years. Man, you've done some cool stuff. You raised the dead. You healed the blind. That's really cool. Just show us the father and we'll, that'll be good enough. And then here's Jesus' response. Jesus says, have, you, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen... If you want to see what God looks like, just look at Jesus. Just look at Jesus and you'll see. He says, don't you know I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is me? The words I speak are not my own, but the Father who lives me and does his work through me. If you want to see what God is really like, you need to do more than listen to me. You need to read the Bible. One of the ways to see and hear God and connect with him on a regular basis is to read the Bible. Now, I'm going to give you a cheat sheet, okay? So, shh, don't tell anybody I told you how to cheat, okay? There's something called the Bible app. 
It's on your phone. It's an app for your phone. It's really, really cool. Um, I wish I had my phone on me. Um, Life Point Church puts it out, or Life, Life Church, lifechurch.tv.org, something. They put out this Bible app, and every day it will send you a verse of the day. And every day on your phone, it will pop up. And if you open it, there is a verse that tells you about God. Listen, you don't even have to go somewhere to open a Bible. In today's society, they'll actually send you, a, like, a, cool is that? So don't tell me that you don't have time to make time for the Bible. They'll send it to you. That's a cheat read. Okay, here's the second way that you and I can see and hear God. It's through people. It's our least favorite way, isn't it? Matter of fact, I saw um, a Facebook comment. Someone said, you know, I, I like the idea of church, but I've been hurt by people at church. And to that, I want to say I'm sorry. And I want to say it's true. You know, church people aren't perfect. We're imperfect people, all of us. If you're perfect, run. We will mess you up. <laughs> right? There, there are no perfect people, right? And here's what I want to say to people who go, well, I've been hurt by church people. Well, here's what I would say. All people hurt all people. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to be a Christian to hurt people. I've met a lot of non-followers of Jesus who, who, are, who are hurtful. They have broken and busted families. They're mean to their coworkers. They, they, you know, they, they betray their friends. They, they, you know, things don't work out. Listen, you don't have to be, go to church to be someone who's hurt people. People hurt people. But I do know this, we can see and hear God through people. Listen, most of you ended up at a church or ended up here because someone Someone, there you go, someone invited you. Someone invited you. Matter of fact, your introduction to the faith about Jesus probably came from a person. You didn't just grab the Bible by yourself. God didn't just show up in heaven. Someone probably talked to you. Someone invited you to church. God uses people. Now, I want to give you an example. Um, I have this hobby, and, and I'm not really good at my hobby. My hobby is powerlifting, and, and I'm built to be a cross-country runner, not a powerlifter. So I'm in the bottom 10% of, like, powerlifters. Like, I'm just really bad, but I have fun. And, and so I go to the gym on a regular basis, and here's what I notice about the gym. I go to the gym, and if you go on a regular basis and you go long enough, you make friends with the people that, that, that kind of lift in the same areas that you and do kind of the same exercises as you. So, so I have a group of powerlifting friends. Most of them don't go to church and that's really cool because I get to hang out with them um, and they include me in their club even though I'm a pastor right um, and so here's what I discovered about kind of my hobby of powerlifting when I go to the gym is two things happen is that sometimes when I'm doing a difficult lift or having a difficult lay day my friends who are there will encourage me and they'll yell at me and they usually include curse words and they go oh I forgot and I'm like it's okay I, I, it's not like the first time I've ever heard it right and they're usually encouraging me you can lift the weight you can do it and they're like encourage me come on Matt just you know they, they, they encourage me that when I'm having a bad day or when I feel like something is too heavy they give me encouragement. Also, as I'm lifting, sometimes my friends, when I ask them, how does my form look? Am I doing this so that I'll actually, in a competition, my lift will actually count and, and it'll go. And they'll go, no, 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 you, you didn't make your depth on your squat or your heels came up on your bench press or, or you hitched your deadlift. They'll say, no, 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 you need to improve your form. And so I go, thank you. But here's what I know. If I didn't have them, my experience would be very limited and I would not be who I want to be. And here's what I want you to know. This is so, so important. People go, I can have a relationship with God. I don't need to go to church. And that is true. But listen, I want you to know, in isolation, you will always be limited and you will have an incorrect view because you have no one to encourage you when you're struggling and you have no one to go, ooh, you know, when you say God wants you to be happy and you're doing that thing, that thing's gonna, that thing's gonna bring some destruction in your life. And you know, I'm not trying to, I'm not better than you. I'm equal at the foot of the cross, but as your friend and as a genuine follower of Christ, like I, I wanna let you know, God often speaks to us through, but if you're not around them, it's really hard to hear. I mean, if, if you're not around other people who are going in the same direction, if you're not around other followers of Jesus, how do you get encouragement? And how do you know when you go, hey, I think I should do this. And they go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't you know? Like, that's just, that, no, you shouldn't do that. That's the wrong, wrong way to go that. You need to be around people. And listen, I want to say something about this because I think everyone should be engaged in a local church. But here, here's what I want to say. Church is not a hiding place. Church is a place you engage and then you go and you live life. 
I love what the scripture says. Here's what Jesus says. Jesus said, freed a man from a bunch of demons. It says, the man who had been freed from demons begged to go with him. That's Jesus. He said, Jesus, thank you for healing me of whatever this thing is that I had. I don't know, the demonic, whatever, but Jesus, thank you. I want to go spend time with you. But look what Jesus said. But Jesus sent him home saying, no, go back to your family and tell them everything is God has done for you. Jesus didn't want him to hide or to huddle. Jesus sent him because God always uses people to impact other people. And if you don't believe me, then why did he send Jesus in the form of a person? Because God uses people. So you got to be around people. Third thing where we can see and hear God do, and we're going to put it up on the screen, is creation. We can see and hear God in creation. Listen, listen, did anyone have bacon this morning? <laughs> did your taste buds go off when you got that juice? Like bacon is so good, right? Like that's creation, right? I mean, do you, have you ever heard the laughter of a little baby? Have you ever seen those little kitten videos and they make you laugh, right? Have, have you ever seen the sun set and, and, and you ever smelt a flower that was so beautiful? Have you ever looked at a beautiful scenery and said, wow, that looks so beautiful? God speaks to you and I and we can hear and see God in creation. And here's why it's so important. Listen, when you decide you're gonna date someone, you decide if you're going to marry someone, when you decide they're going to be my friend or I want to be engaged in a relationship with them, you always look at the consequences of their actions because if they have off all their actions create negative consequences, you avoid them. You should, right? You can be friendly towards them, but you want to be careful if they have the pattern of always making mistakes and always doing things to be hurtful. Like you look at the consequences. Creation is the consequences of God's actions and it lets us know how good he is. We can see and hear God through creation. I love what the scripture says. We're going to put on the screen Psalm, 9, um, Psalm 19. Um, it says, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies di display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound of word. Their voice is never heard, yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. Listen, you might not be able to audibly hear God, but when you look out at creation, you can hear and see him. And sometimes we're just so busy that we stop to notice the beauty around us. And then lastly, the way we can hear and see God on a practical basis is prayer. Simply talking to God. I mean, imagine this. Imagine trying to have a friendship where you never talked. You and I would never imagine a dating relationship, a marriage relationship, a sibling relationship, a best friend relationship without any kind of communication, whether it's texting or talking or letters. There would always be some kind of personal communication. And at some point for a friendship to work or a marriage to work or for, for whatever kind of relationship to work, there has to be some one-on-one -on -one time where there is some genuine connection, where they get to see you for who you are, you get to see them for who they are, and there is a genuine connection there. And that's exactly what prayer is. I love what Jesus says about prayer. When he talks about what prayer is, we see this in the gospel of Matthew. It says, and when you pray. So Jesus doesn't say if you pray. Jesus says, when you pray. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others, being religious. I'm gonna pray so people think I know God. It's like looking like the good plant, but it's in water and it's really actually dead. Truly, I tell you, they've already received their reward in full. And he says, but when you pray, again, not if you pray, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, don't keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. Jesus uses the word Father three different times to explain something to us deeply. That when you and I pray, you are connecting with your heavenly Father. You are not slaves. You're not robots. You are sons and daughters. And your heavenly father is waiting to have a conversation where we get to see him and hear him and where he gets to see and hear us. So if I had to sum it all up, I'd go something like this. Listen, religion is all that's left if we don't make time to regularly connect with God. Here, here's the reality. Listen, listen, we all have time. I mean, we binge that Netflix show, right? Like we all got time, right? Like, like the question isn't that we don't have time, it's that we don't make time. I'm gonna go back to my friendship. I didn't do anything wrong, he didn't do anything wrong, we just didn't make time. 
So I wanna close with something that is a little bit scary, but man, is it so true. And so I'm gonna warn you ahead of time, it's a little bit scary as, as we come to a close of this message. Uh, back in the spring, we did a marriage series here. Uh, I don't know if anybody remember that, Happily Ever After, or something like that. We did marriage thing here. It was, hopefully you got a lot of it. But in my research, I discovered an amazing fact about marriage, a couple of them. Did you know that for every year you're married, your likelihood for divorce goes down? So for each year of marriage that you're married, your likelihood of divorce goes down. So just stay married longer, and then your divorce like is likely to go down. So just stay married. That's great advice, right? Here's something else I discovered discovered during that marriage series. Did you know in the last decade, the marriage divorce rate has actually gone down. It's, 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 it's gone down the, the opposite way. Divorce rates have actually gone down. Yes, that's good. That's good. There's one happy couple over there, right? Right, and you know, the divorce rate went down. But he, here's, here was where I got shocked. Here was a stat that I'd never saw coming. They said there was one surprising fact in the dis- divorce statistics, and it was this, that while the majority of divorce rates are going down and, and are coming down and are coming to an all-time low, they said there's one group of people where the divorce rate has doubled. And it's called the gray divorce. And I was like, what is the gray divorce? And it meant people with gray hair. And I was really shocked. They said, yes, people in kind of their, their early 50s or have gray hair, there's this block of time right around kind of 48 to 55 that the divorce rate in that age group has doubled Why all the other divorce rates have come down. And as I began to look at the statistics, there was a common thread in all the divorce stuff. Can you guess what it was? They had grown... They had, they had been married, many of them, for more than 20 years. And they looked like they had a good marriage. But when they were empty nesters, when they retired, there was something that happened. And all of a sudden, they realized we had grown. We looked like the part, but we had actually grown apart. So I want to ask you a question. Do you just look like you have a great relationship with Jesus? Are you like a flower that's in a vase that looks alive, but you're not really genuinely connected? And it's not, and listen, it's not because you hate God. It's not because you don't want to be his friend. It's because we haven't made time. Because the reality is, if we do nothing with our relationship, it'll grow apart. The way to genuinely connect with God and have a good relationship is to make time to genuinely connect with Him through reading the Bible, through being around His people, through looking and being a part of creation and through prayer so that we can experience the life that Jesus died for. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. I thank you for the honesty of Jesus who tells us, listen, the only way to experience life is to be connected to you, God. And God, we can look the part for a while, but if we are not genuinely connected, then our relationship and who we're meant to be will wither up because we are meant to be sons and daughters of the Most High. God, may none of us, whether we're watching this video or we were here today or just listening, God, that none of us would settle for religion Because if we don't make time to genuinely connect, that's all that's left. God, help us to make time to see you and hear you and know you so we can experience the life that we were intended to have. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.